If you want to run a fridge and some camp lights in your four wheel drive, this is the most simple, basic 12 volt system that allow you to do that. We put a post up on our four wheel drive 24 seven Instagram page asking for your 12 volt questions. And we're absolutely bombarded with thousands of questions. And most of you guys were really keen to find out the simplest and best bang for buck 12 volt dual battery system you could run in your four wheel drive. So we thought we'll put it to the test and show you two very basic setups, one in a new car and one in an old car. Plus, we're also gonna get a couple of expert 12 volt tips to make your install so much easier. One of the main reasons we run a 12 volt system in our four wheel drive is usually because we wanna run a fridge or some other basic 12 volt accessories. How long you need that system to run is usually what determines what 12 volt system you need. For many, the majority of the camping we do is over a weekend, a maximum of two or three nights. There might be the odd week long Fraser trip thrown in there as well. And most of us will run one fridge, some camp lights, and need to charge a phone or a speaker. If you fit into this category, the good news is you can get away with a really simple 12 volt setup. Now let's first take a look at some of the gear we'll need. Starting with the battery, this one here is a Century AGM 100 amp hour battery. Now with all AGM batteries, you typically get about half the life out of the battery before you need to recharge it. So we essentially have 50 working amps we can use. Now put that in real terms, we're out in the bush. If you're running the fridge, that'll give you about two days worth of use before you need to recharge the battery. Your second battery needs to be a deep cycle battery, meaning it'll keep your fridge running much longer than a normal starter battery. If you're fitting one in the engine bay, you need a flooded battery, which essentially means it can handle the heat of your engine bay. If you're running your second battery in the cab or canopy, an AGM is best because it's fully sealed and won't leak at all. Now we add in the charger. This will mean you can charge your batteries up when you drive, and if you want, with solar. There's two great options for a simple setup depending on what alternator your four-wheel drive runs. Want to know what alternator is in your four-wheel drive? Well, there's a link in the description that'll help you. Just put in your vehicle details and it'll show you what charger you need. Now, this one here is the iconic SBI 100 isolator from Red Arc. Now, it's fully Australian made and it will cost you under 200 bucks. Now, if you've got an older vehicle with a fixed voltage alternator, this would be perfect to do a basic dual battery system. Most vehicles before 2008 have what's called a fixed voltage alternator, which puts out a constant 14 volts to charge your battery. However, most modern four-wheel drives have smart alternators, which vary the amount of voltage it outputs, depending on engine temperatures, vehicle loads, and driving conditions, to reduce the load in the engine, which saves fuel. Isolators need the volts constant to work. When a smart alternator drops the voltage output too low, the isolator won't kick in and won't charge a second battery. If you want to learn more about choosing the right size charger or type of charger for your particular four-wheel drive, we covered this in much more detail in this video. The link is in the description. This right here is a basic dual battery system or an isolator. Now look how simply it works. You basically have your start battery right here, you connect that to your isolator, and then you have your second battery over there. Um, you've got a ground wire, and of course you've got an override wire, which is really, really neat. Now an override wire means that you can complete the circuit back to the isolator, you can have a switch inside your cab. Now say for some reason you flatten your start battery, you can actually start your vehicle off your secondary battery, so it overrides the isolator essentially. Now you also want to fuse this wire here from your start battery, I suggest you use a MIDI fuse, likewise a fuse in between the isolator and your second battery. You pretty much should fuse just about every single um, positive wire on your vehicle anyway. So that is a basic um, isolator. They work really well in older vehicles that have like a fixed voltage alternator. Super simple to install, yet super effective. For older four wheel drives, a 12 volt setup can be as simple as this. You then just run your accessories off the second battery. Keep watching and we'll show you some handy tips on how to do this later in the video. Now, we're gonna be installing this little charger right here into the back of the Hilux. Now, this one here is a Red Arc BCDC 1225D. Now, it'll charge your second battery at 25 amps. It's fully Australian made, it's waterproof, and it also has solar input. So you can run a solar panel on your four-wheel drive later if you want to as well. Now, um, we'll be, we've got all the basic stuff here. We're gonna mount this onto a panel in the back of the four-wheel drive, and I'm gonna show you all the tips to do that properly. So you might be thinking, why Red Arc? Now, I've got a long history with Red Arc products and I've run them in my four-wheel drives for the last decade. I started off with a basic isolator and moved to a BCDC. I've had manager 30s. I'm just about to try out the brand new Red Vision. Now, the reason I keep coming back to Red Arc is they're Australian made and they just work. It's simple as that. I go to some very remote places right around Australia and I just want to know that my 12-volt system 
is A-OK -okay every single time I turn key on my four-wheel drive. Now, with, when it comes to 12 volt, I really, really suggest that you get the best system that you can afford because at the end of the day, it's one of those things you just don't want letting you down. And when you get Red Arc, you don't have to think twice. So we've got everything we need to install this in the back of the Hilux. Let's get right to it. If you want the most basic 12 volt setup for your old or modern four wheel drive, these are your two best options. You can get these installed professionally, but if you're like us and want a DIY install your 12 volt to save money, keep watching because we're going to show you 10 basic tips that'll make the job easier. Ensure your system works perfectly for as long as you own the vehicle. Well, now's the time we can start the install and get the 12 volt system fitted up in the Hilux. Now behind me, I've got the experts from Pinnacle 4x4. Now we trust them with all the maintenance of our four wheel drives to make sure we can go right around the country incident free. They're also 12 volt gurus. So along the way, we're gonna be racking their brains so they can come up with 10 of the best DIY tips to make sure you can install a 12 volt system in your four wheel drive the best possible way. Now we're gonna show you some of the tools that you're gonna to need to do a job like this yourself in the driveway. Now when it comes to tools, there's a few specialty ones that are gonna make life so much easier. So let's have a look. Now firstly, we've got a set of crimpers. Now there's two different types of crimpers. You can typically get a cheap set like this or a set of crimp pliers. Now I like the crimp ones um, myself. They're a good set. Um, a 12 volt soldering iron. Now you can get one that plugs into the wall, but a good quality soldering iron is a must have for this job. Um, a set of side cutters. Again, a good quality set of side cutters wire strippers, it just makes the job so much easier. Um, now when it comes to seeing exactly what sort of voltage we're getting and charging, now there's two options here. A basic multimeter like this will, will get the job done, no worries. This one here is a test light. I'll probably use a test light a little bit more than the multimeter. And the bonus of this test light in particular actually tells what voltage is coming in as well as a test light. So it's a two in one tool, which is fantastic. But as you can see, you don't need a heck of a lot of tools to get the job done properly. Here's a checklist everything you need to install this basic 12 volt setup. Charger, battery, cable positive and earth, terminals, fuses, heat shrink, zip ties, conduit, solder, Anderson plugs, cloth tape or electrical tape. So let's take a look at the wiring we'll need to run from the start battery to the BCDC charger. Now, keeping in mind this Red Arc BCDC is a 25 amp charger, so at maximum it's gonna draw anywhere up to 25 amps worth of charge, even potentially a little bit more. So we need to make sure we've got wiring that's gonna be able to handle that, and also wiring that's gonna handle the distance between the front and the back, because you're gonna get voltage drop, of course, with that sort of distance. We're talking about about four or maybe five meters worth of distance there of wire. So you need to over-engineer the wiring. If you under-engineer the wiring, of course, it's going to build up a lot of heat and potentially melt the wires. Melting wires in your engine bay or anywhere around your vehicle is not a good thing. Trust me, it can cause fires and a lot of damage on the vehicle. And this one here is um, 8 BNS. It's rated up to 75 amps. Now, this is going to be super over-engineered and also ensure that we're going to get no voltage drop across the vehicle. Now, when it comes to fuses, of course, we're going to run fuses um, in this system and a fuse before the Red, the Red Arc BCDC charger. Now, a lot of people go with a simple inline blade fuse with a waterproof holder. Now, these have got their applications in four-wheel drives, but certainly not when you're dealing with high amperage and high current draws like this uh, BCDC charger here. So the best fuse that we can go for is a MIDI fuse. If you've ever seen one of these, these form a really strong connection. That's where these differ. Now, you could put a 30 amp fuse into this one, no dramas at all but the connection you get with a MIDI fuse is far superior. It doesn't cause excess heat, and I've seen a lot of these ones melt when you're running a lot of amperage and current through them. They're just not up to the task. So always try and run a MIDI fuse, and that way your system will be super safe and very effective. Now right now I wanna demonstrate um, two common mistakes a lot of people make when they're um, doing their own 12 volt. And um, they're two very costly mistakes that could actually mean your whole full drive burning to the ground. So I wanna demonstrate those mistakes. The first one is using the incorrect gauge wire. So now the way I'm going to demonstrate using the incorrect gauge wire is running a couple of high powered 12 volt accessories off this battery and using a wire that is clearly a lot too um, small to run. There's probably about 30 amps maybe worth of draw coming here, maybe 40 amps. And um, this little wire here simply won't cut the mustard. So I'll show you what will happen. That, there's a compressor. See straight away, <laughs> that's getting really, really hot. So I'll put the compressor on. So now that light's on as well, probably running up to 40 amps off that little bit of wire. Yeah, that, that wire there is, is too hot to touch and it's actually starting to melt. You can see 
how hot that wire is, you can't even touch it. Now imagine you do that in your own four wheel drive, that melts through, that could potentially cause a fire in your four wheel drive. And that's all because you use the incorrect gauge wire. So whenever you're doing any 12 volt project, work out what everything's gonna draw and make sure you over engineer. Look at that, it's about to burn all the wire in the vehicle. And finally, I'm gonna show you what happens when you don't have a fuse or you've got a live wire that's not protected and not fused. Now that is one of the quickest ways you can start a fire in your four wheel drive. Now have a look what happens. I have a go of that, that scares me every time. Now just imagine you've got a live wire in the back of your four wheel drive. Your four wheel drive is essentially earth, so it's exactly the same as touching a positive on a negative and you're gonna have sparks everywhere. And again, that'll be the quickest way that your four wheel drive will go up in flames. Placing a fuse here will make sure that if there is a short, that the power is gonna stop where the fuse is broken. Now, when it comes to running cables, there's a lot of mistakes that a lot of people make, and um, you're gonna be running a lot of cables when you do your 12 volt system. Um, one of the, the big things to do is, of course, run conduit on your cable, especially any cables that are gonna be underneath the chassis like this one here, and this one's going up the headboard onto the roof of the canopy and coming down into the canopy. I really recommend use conduit and just about every single wire going through your vehicle. Um, now, underneath the chassis, places like that, a wire that's just bare on its own. Now, while it does have some protection, it's not enough for four-wheel drive use especially. Now, imagine this is something on the side of your four-wheel drive, there's a lot of metal under there, there's a lot of sharp edges. So if that wire was sitting there rubbing on a bit of metal and you know, fast forward over five, 10,000 kilometers, you can imagine there's already damage on that wire, that'll go through in no time at all. Now the way to protect that of course, is just feed some conduit over that wire and therefore, you're never gonna have an issue. So the general rule of thumb is if you're running any wires in your four wheel drive, make sure they're protected, make sure they have some form of conduit over them. It looks a lot neater, but more importantly, it's gonna last a lot longer. So conduit is very important obviously, but getting the length of the cable right in the first place is really important. You can see the guys here have got excessive cable because the last thing they wanna do is run a little bit too short and um, have to put a joiner or a connector in there. That's not very neat and not a very good uh, way to run your cable. So it's a good idea to have a look on your chassis to make sure that this wiring is nowhere near the bottom side of the chassis. So therefore, it is really bush-proof. When you go off-road and you scrape across some rocks and sticks and stuff like that, nothing's gonna get hung up. In fact, these guys are gonna actually run it on top of the chassis rail, so it's really protected. And then use cable ties every 30 centimeters to make sure there's nothing hanging down and um, this system will be very, very bush-proof. Now I reckon a 12 volt panel is a great idea and they're very simple to make just using a bit of plywood and a bit of marine carpet uh, like this one in the back of the 79 series here or the one in the back of that Hilux. Of course this one's got a lot more stuff on it and when you come time to making your own 12 volt panel it's best to try and make it of course outside the vehicle. So that step number one is to get all the accessories that you're going to run on your panel and lay them out onto that board and try and have a think about I access my canopy from here, where are you gonna put the accessories so everything is very logical and easy to use? So of course I want my switches for all my lights right here, so it's easy to get to as soon as I open that canopy door. Laying it all out on a board outside the vehicle is a good way to ensure that everything is laid out very nicely. Then of course, once you mount everything onto that panel, do all the wiring that you can do outside the vehicle. Therefore, you can put it all back in and it makes it nice and easy, so you're not trying to deal with really tight and confined spaces in the back of a four wheel drive. This needs to go right near your second battery. The reason you need the charger close to the second battery is voltage drop. You can imagine if the charger is a long way from the second battery, all that power it is outputting will be less by the time it gets to the battery, meaning it won't charge as fast. By putting it close to the second battery, you ensure there's no voltage drop and your battery will charge as fast as possible. So we're gonna mount this one on a panel very close to the second battery, which is inside the canopy here. Now the other thing you need to consider is where you're gonna mount your fuses. Now, if this one here is, your battery charger is going in the canopy here, of course it's gonna be getting charged from your alternator and your start battery. So you're gonna need a, a fuse, essentially a MIDI fuse in the engine bay as close to where the source of the power is as possible. You'll also need another fuse in between your charger and this battery here. And of course, from whatever you use, your secondary battery to charge. So say you've got something like a fridge or a set of camp lights, you'll need fuses on that as well. So essentially you'll need three lines of fuses before you can run something like a fridge. Now one thing you'll notice um, when you see the boys do all their 12 volt work is they use a lot of heat shrink and they use it really well and you should get in the habit of using heat shrink in all your 12 volt jobs because it really um, insulates and protects a lot of your connections or, or an exposed wire um, so it doesn't short out. 
There's a trick to getting it right though, especially with battery terminals as Steve taught me. So you wanna use the heat shrink to get it up nice and close to that terminal, but make sure it doesn't interfere with the connection that the terminal's gonna have with the battery. The other thing you'll notice as well is these guys actually use a marine grade heat shrink. Now the difference between that and, and um, some of the cheap stuff you'll buy is this actually has a glue inside and that allows no moisture to come through. That's a great little connection now. And that's actually, you can see the glue at the back of this means no moisture is going to get up in there and that is a really good seal. Another connector that's going to be very handy to you, especially if you're trying to run power into a canopy, is something like this gland nut here. Now what it does, of course, is you're able to get a very waterproof seal when a wire is coming from the outside of your canopy onto the inside. Ignition power is run to accessories that should only turn on when you turn on your vehicle on. In modern vehicles, the BC-DC charger needs to know when the car is on and the alternator is running, so it can let the power into the second battery. So you need to run a wire to a source of ignition power. Now chances are if you've got a new vehicle like this Hilux here, it's got a smart alternator. Now if you've got a smart alternator, your battery charger is going to require an ignition wire. So to tap into your ignition system, there's a couple of different ways you can do it. Now one of course, um, which I don't recommend, is you can go in through your windscreen wiper motor, um, you can go through your cigarette socket. Um, look, you can get an ignition feed from that, no dramas at all. The problem is, of course, if you do um, put something in your cigarette socket and blow a fuse, well, you're also going to blow out the ignition um, for your charger, so therefore your charger is not going to work. Now, a really neat way of tapping into your ignition is to actually find in your factory fuse box in the engine bay usually um, a source from your ignition and then use one of these fuse jumpers. So it runs two fuses. The factory fuse will go down the bottom here and there'll be a fuse to the new wire which will go to your battery charger to give it a feed from the ignition. Now, if you've got an older vehicle that doesn't have a smart alternator, it's got a fixed voltage alternator, well, you won't even need to worry about running um, any sort of ignition feed. One of the main things that'll let a whole 12 volt system down is a very poor quality earth. And another thing you need to remember is when you're earthing your battery charger, earth it to the exact same place you earth your second battery. So in this case, on this Hilux, we've earthed everything back to the chassis. So make sure you pick a spot on your chassis where there's no dirt or mud, you clean it up nice, you use the proper size wiring, over-engineer it, so your earth will never let you down. All right, the next tip we wanna talk about is soldering versus crimping. Now, I've got Steve with me because um, Steve's actually taught me a couple of things here today, and um, look, this is a topic that will divide a lot of people, how to get a good connection on your 12 volt system. Um, and there's, there are wrong and right answers, no doubt about it. And we'll go through a couple of um, the different ways that um, Steve reckons will give the best connection. Now, Steve's a big believer of crimping over soldering. And the reason is, mate, is because, and it makes perfect sense, is a solder, of course, a solder is not designed to um, flex at all. That's so right. if you've got a four wheel drive that's doing a lot of, you know, corrugations, a lot of hard trips up in Cape York and stuff like that, the first place typically where a 12, 12 volt system is going to come apart is in the connection. And if you're soldering, well, that's going to get brittle and just crack. Yeah, it gets brittle and can crack at that point because it doesn't have the flex that the copper has. Yeah. The copper has. Yeah. So, so technically, the best bush proof um, join between two wires you can get is crimping. Really good crimping. Yeah, so, double crimping. So double crimping, using the right terminals. And um, we'll soon learn as well exactly what gear we need to make sure that, you know, I'm talking about the right type of heat shrink. You know, Steve's using a marine grade heat shrink because it's got a glue inside it and it, it performs just a better seal. There's so many little tips you can you can get out of this, which makes your whole 12 volt system come apart and be a lot more bush proof. Um, we can talk about these battery lugs just quickly. Now, Steve has crimped these um, with side cutters. He uses side cutters so he can get the feel right. He's got 20 years experience under his sleeve. So keep that in mind. You can actually get a proper tool to crimp these so you can actually you know, it makes that's it easier right. for, for those of us that don't have the experience. Um, that's something I'd do. I'd probably use the right crimper if I could. Yep. Um, another little tip as well is there's a little hole in the back here. You can actually get a little bit of solder down the back of these battery terminals as well for an even better connection. That's right, just at the top. You just, just want to solder just the top of that connection. Yeah, yep. and um, if you get the solder to go right down through the cable, um, that of course is going to get a brittle connection right. and you don't want that. So this is this can actually move around a lot and you can see there's nothing stopping those wires from moving around. Not that they're going to move around, but heck, you're doing this right and you just want to make it sure it lasts. Exactly. Um, when we come to the other end here, you've got a smaller gauge wire um, we're going to connect two wires together here 
This is basically just a standard connector, but what I like about these connectors is it's got heat shrink That's right, built they're into a, it. They're a heat shrink um, connector with the glue internally as well to seal the connection as well. So if it is in a, in a moisture content, um, then that uh, will actually be sealed. Yeah, so that's a really clever little idea. And uh, again, these are crimped and not soldered. Now you could go, you could solder two wires together and then use heat shrink. That's, a, that's one way of doing it. But again, that solder of course is gonna be quite a brittle and uh, stiff connection. And um, we're just crimping everything here and using heat shrink on every single connection. So there's no bit of wire that's exposed. And um, that is a very good little setup, mate. And if you follow those little tips through your whole 12 volt build, you'll have a very bush proof setup and it's gonna last the test of time. Steve, another thing, mate, I've noticed that you've used cloth tape, which is the first for me, the first time I've actually seen it, yeah. um, over electrical tape. Now, a lot of people use electrical tape, there's nothing wrong with that, but this is just one step better, isn't it? Yeah, it's just a, just another step up, sticks to itself really well, rather than um, the traditional electrical tape. And um, we use it in a lot of ways, but it's really great for finishing the ends of your, ends of your conduit as well. Um, very OE style of doing it. Um, wrap your conduit, uh, wrap your, uh, Cloth tape, tape around the, that first, run that over it, and then run your cloth tape over it. And Just that actually like that. finishes the end of your conduit up really nicely as well. See, that's really clever in a way, because you basically, you can seal the, the wire from the conduit and also it won't pull through as well. That's right. It's got a nice keeps little connection it, there. Keeps it connected. That's yep. very clever, mate. Tell us what you think. Do you solder or crimp your terminals and wiring? Tell us in the comments below. One thing you'll notice about this 12 volt setup is we've used Anderson plugs to connect the wiring from the vehicle to the canopy. So if this guy ever wants to take his canopy off, maybe his tray, he'll be able to do that by simply unplugging the Anderson plugs. I also find that Anderson plugs have a really good connection and you should really get into the habit of using Anderson plugs anywhere you can when you're doing a 12 volt system. So not just on the main wires that are going to and from the vehicle, I like to even cut off the SIG socket on the back of the fridge and replace that with an Anderson plug because I find that even if you go across corrugations and really rough roads, that, that will never really uh, slip. An Anderson plug has a great connection. It's also rated for 50 amps as well, so it doesn't matter what size wires you're running through the Anderson plug, you know it's gonna be up to the task. I just walked past Steve and he showed me a cool little trick about mounting a SIG socket and a USB socket in the back of your four wheel drive, so I thought I'd pass it on. Now, look how he's run these wires. And, um, one of the problems that he finds with a lot of people is they'll just run the wires, and look, I'd do the same, I'd run the wires just straight through the hole at the back here, but he's actually looped them over the mounting point. So if you do manage to pull on the back of those wires, you're not gonna pull the terminals off the back of the SIG or the USB socket. Now, another thing as well, I would typically just run those together on the same fuse, yeah. but um, Steve's actually run two separate wires off the back here with two separate fuses. He's labeled both, so he knows exactly which one's which when he's installing it. And the reason is, now say your fridge is running off the SIG socket, you're charging maybe your mobile phone off the USB, USB trips for some reason, you're not gonna lose your fridge power. So keeping everything separately fused is the way to go and I reckon that's a neat little trick, mate. And um, just a little cable tie at the back here as well, just further bush proofs that, that is going nowhere. And just like that, we're done. How good is that setup? But I know you're sitting at home thinking, what's that gonna set me back? Well, let's run the numbers. If you've got an old four-wheel drive, you're looking at about $600 with an isolator. With a new four-wheel drive, it'll be more around that $1,000 to $1,200 mark for everything you need from start to finish. Yes, you can do it cheaper and can get cheaper components. But what we are showing you here is what it'll cost to do right and ensure your 12-volt system lasts as long as you have your four-wheel drive. We are big believers in buying quality when it comes to 12-volt gear. Having a cost-effective and reliable 12 volt setup is a must-have in just about every vehicle if you're serious about getting off the beaten track. Now, we've got the Red Arc system wired up properly in here, so we know it's gonna last an absolute lifetime. Some of the 12 volt skills we went through and demonstrated during this vehicle you'll be able to use to do your very own DIY projects at home. Save yourself a bunch of money, plus you'll also be able to use some of those skills to diagnose and repair your vehicle out in the bush. The whole topic of 12 volt automotive wiring can be very complex. Now, if we haven't covered something properly or you've got a couple of questions, make sure you put them in the comments below. We'll try to get to each and every one of you guys. 
Um, also, if you're interested in the Red Ark products that we used in this build, you can find out more information and purchase those at redark.com.au. And just remember, you can purchase them worldwide. They are some of the best 12 volt gear you can put in a four wheel drive. And uh, when it goes with anything automotive and 12 volt, I always say buy the best that your money can afford and um, it'll never let you down. So thanks again for watching this show and make sure you like this video and also subscribe to the best four wheel driving channel on YouTube, four wheel drive 24 seven.